Now I need to get back to the where I was before in that first example of making everything outside that shape black and white. So here's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to use adjustment layers because, again, adjustment layers are a more flexible way than simply going to the adjustment uh, menu. So I need to make a selection based on this rectangle. And the simplest way to do that is hold down the Command key on the Macintosh, Control for Windows, and click right on this thumbnail. Now it's important to note that in CS2, things changed a little bit because in CS or earlier, you could command or control click anywhere on that layer to load it as a selection. Now, you must click right on that little thumbnail or else it won't work. Okay, so now I've made a selection based on that rectangle. I'm going to go to my adjustment layer. And we're going to talk about adjustment layers a little more in a moment and use hue saturation. And what I'm going to do is simply lower the saturation all the way down, which makes it black and white, and maybe lighten it just a little bit. Now, you'll notice quite clearly you can see that it's the wrong way around. I wanted the other way. But I did this deliberately because the first time I tried this, I tried a different approach, and it didn't work. And I'll show you that different approach in a moment so you can see why I did it the way I did. Because I know some of you were thinking, why didn't he just inverse the selection first? And you'll see why in a moment, because I tried it, and it didn't work. So now I have this adjustment layer with the layer mask sitting there. And you can see that the layer mask is mostly black with a bit of white. And if you're not that familiar with the layer mask, the concept is fairly simple. A layer mask means anywhere that's black will hide the effects of that layer, in this case, the adjustment layer. So that's why only that little portion is being desaturated because everything else is being masked. But right now, the problem is it's the wrong way around. I really want the color on the inside and the black and white around the outside. So what I really need is I need my layer mask to be the opposite. I need to have a little black square with a lot of white around it. And the simplest way to do that in Photoshop is you have something you want to be the opposite, you inverse it. And which is Command or Control I does the inverse. And now I have the effect that I want, okay? So at this point, it looks like I'm finished, but here's the beauty of doing it this way. If I were to select these two layers, and in Photoshop CS2, I just shift click on both of them. If this was CS or earlier, I'd have to link the layers together. Now, I can answer yes to just about any question someone asks me. If they ask me, could you make that uh, a little bigger? I can free transform and say, sure, I can make it bigger. Can you rotate it? Yes. Can you move it to a different place completely on the photograph? For some reason, you want to not highlight her at all, but something in the background. So basically, what's happening now is it's a very flexible approach. Now I have what amounts to a movable frame that wherever I move it, the inside will be color and the outside will be black and white. Now, here's the other reason why I like that. If I have another photo and I'm thinking this same effect might look really cool over here, I've already done all the work because I literally just have to take these two layers, drag and drop them over, and now I have the same effect on this photo. And again, I can make it much bigger. Of course, I could change the stroke and fill, or excuse me, the stroke and the drop shadow because those are layer styles. So it's a very flexible way of working because now it took me just a little bit longer to set up, but now I have a very flexible document. And the best part of all is I haven't touched the background layer. The background photo is exactly as I started. So at any time, I can say, you know what? I don't like this at all. I could throw away these layers and be right back to the original photo. So I didn't do anything to the background layer. And this is a term you'll hear over and over again, hopefully, in the world of Photoshop. And that's non-destructive work, meaning do things in a way that give you the effect you want without causing problems to yourself later. So you're not working on the background layer. You're not affecting the background. You're getting the look you want without having to go and say, oops, now I've kind of painted myself into a corner. Now let's go back to this one for a moment. Remember back at this step, I said you might have been thinking, why wouldn't I just inverse the selection and then desaturate? Because at first glance, that would seem to be the way to do it because that will give me right away the effect that I want. But watch what happens, the problem with this. If I want to be really flexible, that's not the best approach. Because if I select inverse and then go and add my hue saturation adjustment layer, 
desaturate. At first, it looks like I'm a genius because I did it in one step. But here's the problem. If I were to select these two layers and then decide to move it over here, all of a sudden I have a problem. See what's happened? The layer mask isn't big enough. Because when you inverse a selection, the selection edges stop right at the edge of your photo. So now you have a layer mask that's this big. By doing it the other way of inversing it after the fact, then you have a virtually endless layer mask. So you can move it to your heart's content. You can move it onto a different photo that's completely a different size. And I could be honest with you, the only way I figured that out was I did it this way the first time and went, oh, that didn't work very well. What else could I do? And that's one of the realities of using Photoshop is going in and going, trying something and going, well, that's close, but that's not quite what I wanted. I want to do some other approach. When it came time to save this file, I would save a version of this just as you see it here as a three-layered Photoshop document. Well, what if someone says, yeah, but I need a JPEG, then I would make a copy. I am a big believer in never, ever using the word flatten unless it's associated with a copy. Here's what I see people do all the time, and frankly, it scares the heck out of me. They have a multi-layer document they've slaved away for so long to make perfect, and then they do this. They go to the pop-up menu, choose flatten image, then they go to save as. Well, my question is, what if your finger slips and you hit save by mistake? Oops. You've just saved a flat version and lost all that work. So don't ever do that. Don't ever use that flatten command under the menu. If you need to create, say, a JPEG that's flattened, go directly to Save As. Don't flatten first, because in this Save As dialog box, it's pretty darn smart. When you open it, it's saying, well, this is a PSD, so it has layers. Right? It's a Photoshop document. It has layers. Watch what happens. As soon as I pick JPEG, Photoshop says, well, JPEG can't have layers, so I'll flatten it for you. So it's going to create a flattened version automatically. And because it's a different file format, it automatically is a different name because it has .jpg on the end. So this is the approach I think everyone should take is, yes, it means you end up with more than one copy of each document, but it gives you that flexibility.